What's new from Apple? There's the new iPhone 16 Pro, built for Apple intelligence. And it comes with the all-new camera control, giving you an easier way to quickly access your camera tools. The new Apple Watch Series 10 has our biggest display and our thinnest design ever. And this? It's the sound of active noise cancellation, now available on one of two new AirPods 4 models. So quiet. Check out all of the new products and new features at Apple.com. You can even buy yourself something new. See Apple.com for product availability updates. Apple Intelligence coming this fall. This is what you do when you've just found that statement handbag on eBay and you want to build an entire wardrobe around it. You start selling to keep buying. Yep, on eBay. Over that all-black everything phase, list it and buy all the color. Feeling more vintage than ever? It's out with the new and in with the pre-loved. Next thing you know, you've refreshed your wardrobe basically without spending a dime. Yeah, eBay, the place to buy and sell new, pre-loved, vintage, and rare fashion. With Walmart's new Fresh and Frozen subscriptions, you can save time on your weekly grocery shopping. Dad, you're supposed to be grocery shopping. And miss the chance to embarrass you in front of your friends? (laughs) I subscribe to snacks and wet napkins. You know how messy you are. Dad! Walmart, subscribe to your weekly list. What's brown and sounds like a bell? Why did the farmer trade cow manure for goat poop? It was a dung deal. Did you hear about the dirty Easter egg hunt? It was hosted by the dust bunny. If you just read the bio for Dr. Steve, host of Weird Medicine on Sirius XM 103 and made popular by two really comedy shows, Opie and Anthony and Ron and Fez, you would have thought that this guy was was a bit of, uh, you know, a, a clown. Why can't you give me the respect that I'm entitled to? I've got diphtheria crushing my esophagus. I've got Ebola virus dripping from my nose. I've got the leprosy of the heart valve exacerbating my incredible woes. I want to take my brain out and blast it with the wave, an ultrasonic echographic and a pulsating shave. I want a magic pill for all my ailments, the health equivalent of Citizen Kane. And if I don't get it now in the tablet, I think I'm doomed and I'll have to go insane. I want a requiem for my disease. From the world-famous Cardiff Electric Network Studios, it's Weird Medicine, the first and still only uncensored medical show in the history of broadcast radio, now a podcast. I'm Dr. Steve with my little pal, Tacey. Hello. Hello, Tacey, and my partner, Carissa, DNP Carissa, hello. Hello. This is a show for people who had never listened to a medical show on the radio or the internet. If you've got a question you're embarrassed to take to a regular medical provider, if you can't find an answer anywhere else, give us a call at 347-766-4323. That's 347. Who had? Follow us on Twitter at Weird Medicine. Visit our website at drsteve.com for podcasts, medical news, and stuff you can buy. Most importantly, we are not your medical providers. Take everything here with a grain of salt. Don't act on anything you hear on this show without talking it over with your health care provider. Okay, please don't forget to check out stuff.drsteve.com, stuff.drsteve.com. And uh, if you're interested in the Phoenix erectile dysfunction device, this is a, an acoustic shockwave device that uh, you can pay thousands of dollars to go to a med spa and have a stranger you know, cradle your jungle region while you scream, it's the shrinkage, the shrinkage, while they're running a probe up and down. Or you can buy this thing uh, and do it yourself in the privacy of your own home for a fraction of the cost. I'm not saying it's cheap. It is expensive. Go check it out, though, at ed.drsteve.com. And if it's something that you think you need, talk it over with your health care provider. But um, they have a payment program, too, where you could do 29 bucks a month. Is it cheaper to do it? Oh, way cheaper to do it at okay. home. Yeah, it's a fraction of the cost, what you would pay at a med spa. And then you have it. And then you have it, right. And you can do maintenance with it, and you don't have to keep going back and going, well, you know. Yeah. Hmm. So anyway, uh, check that out. ED, as in, you know, Echo Delta, dot drsteve.com. And check out Dr. Scott's website at simplyherbals.net. And go to uh, patreon.com slash weirdmedicine. We need to do a Patreon show, ASAP. 
ASAP. Okay. And uh, patreon.com slash weird medicine. Tacey and I do a show there. It's different than this show. It's all new content. And sometimes we interview celebrities or we have them interview us. Basically, they come on and ask medical questions so they won't wake me up at 2 in the morning asking me the same oh, dumb questions. Oh, Lord, but there's been a lot of drama lately. Oh, well, uh, yes. Okay. So without saying anything more than that, but yes, that is true. There has been a lot of I drama lately. I think it lately. continually. You think that's? I think it, that's just how it is. Yeah. Drama. And then uh, cameo.com slash weird medicine. Cameo.com slash weird medicine. I'll say fluid to your mama or I'll say anything you want me to say to her within reason, of course. And now, uh, be nice to your mama. Tacey and Carissa have been uh, drinking. So yes. this will be an interesting show. So I'm looking forward to it. Let's, let's get going. You ready? Sure. Check out Dr. Scott's website at Simply Herbals Net. That's Simply Herbals Net. He's not here, but we can still play. Feels his, empty his without thing. him. It does sound empty without yeah, him. Yeah, I don't like. It. Um, now, last week we did nothing but questions, and we still didn't get to half of the questions. But I don't think that we should continue. And I'm sorry that was so loud with questions when Scott is not here. Really? Why? Well, what? Should I mean, we I do? don't think we should do a just whole show jokes? of just yeah. Let's uh, <laughs> just tell guy jokes. walks in a bar. Let's right. just um, do the, a normal show and get to the questions that we can listen to me be a boss. Really? This is hilarious. So um, it's what you always do. Yeah, I'm sorry, and and so let's just. <laughs> do the show with our little seg segmenties and segmenties. then um is that a new word <laughs> and then when scott's here we'll just do another question show because he's got a lot of answers okay well it sounds good to me that Let me let's do the first segmenty ain't got it's uh, tacy's right. time of topics a time for tacy to discuss topics of the day not to be confused with Topic Time with Harrison Young, which is copyrighted by Harrison Young and Area 58 Public Access. And now, here's Tacey. Well, hello, everyone. Oh, God. <laughs> hello. <laughs> You're extra today. Okay, so... Um... Have you guys been drinking down there while I was doing my talk? A little bit. Yes. Okay, okay that explains So, um... This story came from Scott. Well, that's because you're an idiot. No. It's because I like to have fun. Okay, Same. go ahead. Same. Okay, so this story came from Scott, which is why it's so boring. Oh, my God. Yes. Oh, and I, he's not even here. I know. I wish he was, though. Oh. Okay, more well. than half a million UTIs are linked to contaminated meat in U.S. each year. I'm sure your boyfriend will be back next time. It's fine. Half million UTIs in U.S. may be caused by E. coli strains from meat products. What? Wait, whoa. U urinary tract infections? Yes. From eating meat? Yes. Well, what's the mechanism of that? Well, I don't know. They, they slap have to on, on and see what, what happens. They slap in the meat on their junkal regions? <laughs> They're using make any sense. a neogenomic approach to mm. track origins of E. coli infections. At George Washington University... <laughs> They <laughs> established that 480,000 to 640,000 UTIs, according to analysis, published in the journal <coughs> One oh. Health. Hmm. You okay? Are you dying? Yeah, so it's got... fine. Do not okay. resuscitate me. She's, okay. she's got the consumption, don't you know? <laughs> Apparently, lots of studies show when people have a bladder infection, it's caused by the same E. coli they have in their gut. Well, yeah. But how does it get into our gut? Because they wipe the wrong way. Oh, well, how does it get into the gut? Okay, sorry. Here's what we know. A UTI can affect any part of the urinary system yes. and are treated with antibiotics. <laughs> Here we go with the writing. And these, I do these sober, so this is not... Oh. Are you ever sober? Yes. Oh. When she wakes up in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> So, okay, um, so yes, yeah, so a urinary tract infection point. can be anywhere in the urinary tract from the kidney through the tubes going from the kidney to the bladder, which are called the ureters, yes. to the bladder, to the urethra. It's a little bit of background information That's for right. everyone. Yes, yes. Women are at a greater so, risk. Yes, why? Back. Why? Well, it doesn't say. UTIs no, can I'm, be I'm life-threatening when severe. That was a rhetorical question. I'm, I'm going to answer it. Okay. Because there's less distance between, there's less protection between the outside world and the inside world for women because your urethras are shorter. 
the male urethra is, well, you know, in my case, like, you know, eight and a half inches from the outside, from the bladder. That's what I was going to say. I was going to give you 11. The female, thank you, thank you. The female (laughs) urethra is uh, much, much shorter than that in most of the time. And when I'm I'm talking about, you know, um, when we're talking male and female, we're talking about sex and assigned sex. So uh, if you don't have a penis, your urethra is shorter, and it's it's just the the penis, the penile urethra is longer in men than it is in in women. So uh, there's more barriers to bacteria getting from the outside to the inside, and uh, that's why. So anyway, go ahead. Okay, so the annual national. Emergency Department bill for complex UTIs rose from 2.8 billion in 2016 to 3.2 in 2018. God, that's crazy, isn't it? There's so many ut- urinary tract infections that you include the doctor visits, the uh, prescriptions for Bactrim, and uh, uh, you know, f- um, uh, fl- uh, fluoroquinolones and other drugs like that that cost billions of dollars a year. That's insane. I mean, I guess it's crazy. Well, it's so, so common. But anyway, go ahead. I mean, I have friends who have them all the time. Yep. And they're gross. Maybe we should talk about why people get them all the time. I know that you're supposed to pee after sex, and that helps. But I know someone <laughs> who gets them no consistently, there. and she... What? Go ahead. She, you want And she um, does get them all the time. So, okay. Scientists <laughs> isolated... <laughs> E. coli oh, strains collected from raw chicken, turkey, and pork. Yes. And then compare it with urine and blood samples from patients. So people aren't washing their hands after handling raw meat? Maybe so. And they found about 8% of E. coli urinary tract infections could be linked to meat. That's disgusting. Okay, so I, I can see a way this would happen, though, is you eat the meat, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, that's what you're supposed to do with it. And the, the some of the E. coli survive, get into your colon, and then they can detect the DNA in your stool and in the bladder, but also on the surface of the of the um, chicken or poultry or whatever. So the, this could just be as simple as people wiping from back to front instead of from front to back, right? And then they're getting urinary tract infections because those E. coli uh, are in their rectum. Um, never mind. And um, they are uh, getting into the uh, bladder through that loop, and so it would make total sense. Maybe because so. I mean, though E. coli, if there's E. coli on your food, it's going to end up in your stool at some point. The stomach, particularly in the United States, where people are taking. Uh, proton pump inhibitors and H2 blockers to increase the pH of their stomach and more bacteria will make it through from the upper GI tract to the lower GI tract. Okay. So it, it do you says, think that that's a viable hypothesis? I do believe okay. so. Yeah, Scientists <laughs> isolated E. coli strains collected from raw chicken, turkey, and pork then compare it with urine and blood samples from patients. Oh, I already read that. Yeah. Most strains of E. coli are not seriously monitored in U.S. food supply. No regulations as to how much can be on the meat, which is interesting. Right. So it is allowed to pass through the food system because it's not deemed to be a risk. Hmm. Um, hope is that their findings will encourage federal regulators to monitor a li- other types of possible Harmful strains like salmonella potential well, to try this do approach about with other types of pathogens. My understanding is that all chicken, and if anybody raises chicken or sells, you know, uh, processed chicken, that all chicken in the United States has salmonella on it. That's just how it is. That's why you don't eat raw chicken. So it has to be cooked properly, uh, either in sous vide up to 130, 135 degrees and kept there for 90 minutes, or to... Um, um, uh, you know, if you're going to do it in the oven, it's got to be brought up to 165 degrees. And that kills the bacteria that are, uh, and chicken is more porous than beef. That's why you can eat raw beef, but you really can't eat raw chicken. And uh, Is this a cooking show? Yeah, well, chicken tartare is not a thing, but Ooh. beef tartare is. So they... Uh, <clears throat> 
I don't know what they're going to do about this. And if you say, well, you must do something about it, then they're just going to throw more antibiotics. This came from one of Scott's hippie. No, it's fine. I mean, I'm just saying they're going to th- throw they're going to throw more antibiotics at these animals and I think make antibiotic resistance that much worse. I think we just have to live with the fact that there's bacteria on our food and we need to cook it properly so that we mm-hmm. don't ca- have, you know, cause problems for ourselves. And well, clean your thought. hands and now, the shit you cut the hands. meat on. And... Yeah. Yes. Right. And don't wash your chicken. If you, hear, if you learn nothing else from this show going forward, do not wash your chicken in the sink because when it, studies have shown that when you sp- use the sprayer to wash your chicken off, that what it does is it sprays salmonella all over your house. Mm. And then it, you can get it through fomite transmission where you touch something where one of those droplets went. You stick it in your mouth or your nose or your eyes, and now you've got a problem. So, mm-hmm. okay. okay. So that is topic one. Okay, excellent. Wow. Very good. Well, we'll give you a bell for that one here. Give thyself a bell. Well, suck it, Carissa. Oh, well, I might. <laughs> <laughs> So topic number two is about misophonia. Ooh. And it's way more common than we thought. Misophonium. Yes. We, that was good. That wasn't. We can all relate to the feeling of repulsion when hearing someone scrape their nails down a chalkboard. But some people can be triggered by far less. Really? Which is totally true. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, P.A. Lydia can be triggered by a picture of an object that's got holes drilled in it. And she'll look at it and she'll go, and she'll start, she'll start gagging. So this will be interesting. I miss her. It's called misophonia. um, Wait. (laughs) UK survey suggests it's more common. Chewing, slurping, snoring, and breathing. It's more than being annoyed. It's about feeling trapped or helpless because you can't get away oh, yeah. from the noise. You're sitting in an airplane yes, next to some stranger, and they brought a fucking uh, subway, disgusting-smelling sub with oil and vinegar and onions mm. and stuff. I know it sounds good, but and, and then they're just chomping away, and you can mm-hmm. hear the sound Close of them eating. Close your fucking mouth. Yes, thank you. I guess I have misophonium, too. So I was trying to give this guy credit here, so just bear with me. Okay. King's College London psychometrician mm. Celia Viterator mm. got volunteers of all sex, age, and ethnicity to get a representation sample of 18 years and older. Okay. He had 772 volunteers, did a questionnaire about triggers, sounds, and emotional responses. Okay. He probed five aspects of misophonia. Mm. Emotional threat, internal and external appraisals, outburst and impact, and then it goes to <laughs> <laughs> prevalence is 18.4%. Hmm. Loud chewing triggered most disgust. Yes, it's yes. disgusting. No one wants to hear you chewing. Mm-mm. Key differences between misophonia and general population, anger, panic, trapped, inability to escape, guilt, yep. shame, anxiety, Because it's withdrawal. your wife and she's sitting next to you sometimes, Suck or your it. husband. No, I don't mean you. One in five in UK have it, which I thought was pretty interesting, but only a few are aware. So people are, like, just really annoyed a lot of times, yep. but not aware of exactly why. Yeah. They blame it on the person and maybe not the noise. Hmm. Like that effing whore sitting next to me. Stop it. Further research is needed. And this research was published in PLOS-ONE. Have you ever heard of that magazine? What is it? PLOS ONE? Yes. PLOS ONE? Yeah. Yeah, PLOS ONE. It's an online thing. This is supposed to be eating sounds. It's not really. Oh, there we go. Dang this is a person eating a cheeseburger. It sounds like a pig. I'd rather hear a pig eating. That's at least cute. Why is it weird? Ugh, okay. Why is it okay? Anyone with misophonium just turn their radio off. Um, One in five, Why baby. is it cute to hear a dog munching down on stuff, but to hear a human doing it because is Because a human should have simple manners. <laughs> Okay, that's true. A dog is not taught manners. 
<laughs> Doggies are good. Tell me I'm wrong. <laughs> Does anyone grow up being taught to chew with their fucking mouth open no. like a horse? No, that's true. It's you true. know, our we son. We do have lips. Close them. I always say, say yes and say no. And we go in there and it's like, yeah, nah. <laughs> And it's like, no. I taught you. Hey, no. you feeling any better? No. No. <laughs> well, see, it's I was like, always I taught, taught yes, ma'am, ma'am is... no, ma'am, yes, sir, no, sir. And that's offensive now. I think ma'am what? is offensive. Mm-hmm. Like, I'm like, People I prefer to be now. called hot young thing yeah. mm-hmm. than ma'am. Yes, hot young thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> oh, uh, wow, that is very interesting. Please tell me more. All right, so that is it with topic time Oh, today. very good. Well, thank you. It's Tacey's Time of Topics. All right, the thanks, Thank you, Scott, for your information. Very good. All right. So, um, let's see here. I'm Boy, I am. I gave a talk just before this, and I'm a little discombobulated myself. How about you want to do some questions? Let's do them. Number one thing, don't take advice from some asshole on the radio. All right, very good. Here we go. This is a good one. We, we need to get this hey, going. Hey, Dr. Steve, it's Stephen, uh, your hey, friend... From Texas with the liver and kidney transplant. I just wanted to, hey, Stephen. if you could remind the listeners that today, this month, is actually um, Donor Awareness Month. Um, being a donor saves life. I'm living proof. Um, I wanted to also tell you how much I appreciate you helping me a number of years ago when I first started having these problems, and you kept up with me and checking on me. And I give you credit for help saving my life. Oh, wow. I really do appreciate you. That's um, I look forward to talking to you personally, hopefully one day, and maybe sharing with your listeners about this whole process. It was long, hard. It was very long and hard. Yeah. I'm um, very lucky to be here. Very lucky to be here. And I owe some of it to you. Thank you so much for your kindness and understanding. Oh, heck, man. And I hope to be able to talk to your listeners here soon. Hi. Yes, Thanks. I would love Bye. that, Steve. I think that's great. You know, my father had a kidney transplant. He did. It extended and his life. And he lived by about 10 years after? Yep, and uh, he didn't have to have dialysis, so that no, was a big No, he never deal. had to have, which, yeah, is, it seems a little unfair with people who do have to versus people who don't. I don't know if some people are, explain to me that, because to some people what? What do, you mean? do have to have dialysis as they're waiting on a kidney transplant, and right. then others just... Oh, my kidneys are bad, and then they get one before you know it, and it it just it does seem. Well, there are certain criteria for they they want to know that you're going to live long enough to be able to use the donor kidney, and the problem is that there are so f- few uh, kidneys or organs out there. And then finding a proper match, and then taking the anti-rejection drugs, and then you got to find a center that is willing to do it. You can't just go to any old place, any community hospital, and get a, a organ transplant. So, what we really need is um, the ability to grow these things in a petri dish from your own cells, and then you don't have to worry about rejection. You don't have to worry about a donor, and that will become a lot more plentiful. Um, and uh, they'll have fewer criteria. For example, uh, you have to be sober. You can't be on certain drugs. You can't be taking pain medication for a lot of transplants. Uh, liver transplant, very difficult to get. Um, if you're taking any sort of pain medication or if you can't drink, you know, they're just a lot. And a lot of people who have, need a liver transplant are people who got that way because they were drinking, and it's sometimes hard for them to uh, quit, and uh, they just never get to the point where they're able to take the transplant. So that it's a big problem, and until we have new technology, either mechanical kidneys that really work that will last you your whole life, and you can just put them in and somehow uh, uh, f- perform the function of the kidney, which is to resorb electrolytes and uh, excrete uh, waste in uh, you know water soluble waste and to maintain blood pressure the kidneys do all kinds of stuff 
So you can't just have a single function machine that you put in. It has to uh, it has to uh, have multifunctional uh, state. And uh, so, very, but until then, we have to donate our organs. So you can sign up to be an organ donor. Just go to organdonor.gov. You select your state, and it'll walk you through the process. And you won't care when it comes. No, up. and exactly right. Very good. You know what? You get you get another. Give thyself a bell. Oh, somebody just, really sucks today. Just because I always suck. Just <laughs> because it's important to to realize that. Um, you can your demise can actually do somebody some good. That's one way to think about it. It's the silver lining. I just went down a rabbit hole. Uh-oh. So sorry. Okay, that's of where what? I've went. Donation. <laughs> and what did you find out? Cell, like using cells to create organs. Yeah, and yeah. also injecting cells. There's a trial that was done as far as injecting cells into someone else's body. Okay, into the donor's body and creating another organ within their body oh wow whoa um Ta- let, read us that that's <laughs> worthy of stopping this um i mean to, no, yeah. i'm literally just like the first sentence in so i'll i'll research it more but literally it's just okay well that's a teaser for five minutes now from now right I in really words, think we you're should gonna, have... You're going to read up on it and then tell us about it here in a minute when I finish my spiel about um, being an organ donor. I, I just want to say, I really think we should have someone who has had a transplant yeah. on the show. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Well, we can do We that. can make a difference. I have his number. Yes, I would love to have him on. Um, but this he, is specifically talking about livers. That's okay. Because livers are so sure. hard to get. All right. Well, what you got? Nothing. I'm still reading. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, keep giving us updates on your progress. Um, you can so, grow many livers. <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> so. Um, In pigs. <laughs> or mice. So they, yeah, just sign up and be an organ owner. You can put it on your your driver's, uh, driver's license. license. Let all your friends and family know. And to be an organ donor for those kind of organs, you either have to be imminently getting ready to die or you need to be brain dead but still be on on life support. So your heart is beating, oxygen is going in, but no oxygen is being pumped to your brain. And then they can take you into the operating room and they can get your liver and they can get your kidneys and your heart and they can take your lungs if somebody has a heart-lung transplant that they need. And it really can can completely turn somebody's life around. And they don't just put these organs in people um, on a whim. It's always people who will not make it very long if they don't have a transplant. And some people go on to live normal lives for quite some time. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's really worth doing, and uh, yeah, it doesn't cost you anything. As a matter of fact, uh, and it, you know, if you don't have viable organs, you can donate your body to a place like Restore Life USA. We've got one of those places in Elizabethton, uh, Tennessee. That's not too too far from the Weird Medicine Studios, where they'll take your body. And after you're done using it, obviously, and they do medical research, and then they cremate you and give you back to the family within a month uh, free of charge. You get a free cremation out of it, and you get to advance medical science. So there's a lot of stuff you can do with your body after you're done using it. So, But, uh, yeah, if you guys want to do a segment and have him in, I would love to. We'll do I that. really would love okay. to. All right, we'll do it. All right. DNP Chris, you got anything on that uh, implantable uh, liver? I mean— I'm still reading the study, but okay. there is, I'm reading about how they studied it in pigs. Yes. And for example, they surgically diverted the blood supply away from the liver yep. in the pigs to cause liver damage. Sure. And then once they had recovered from surgery, the team injected healthy liver cells into their lymph nodes. Ooh. And within a couple of months, the animals appeared to show recovery from their liver damage. Get the hell out of here. That's pretty interesting. Yeah, because, I mean, the lymph node system. Yeah, yeah, we, we have to have um, things like this because the donor program's amazing. But, again, how many people are actually brain dead on the vent? You know, a lot of people die, and then they can't use the, the major organs and once yeah. by the time they get there. So uh, we need a way to manufacture these things or... Not maybe not yours, but maybe we can grow in vats 
all the kidneys and livers and hearts and stuff that we want that have no markers on them. They just don't have immune markers yeah, on them. The body cool. won't kill those. Yeah. That so would that would really work, cool. too. Yeah. So anyway, uh, any of those kinds of things. Uh, there are some organs that we can replace with machines. What? Who said that? I did. Yes, very good. Okay, very good. That's what I was Self a bell. Look at you. Um, the heart is purely a mechanical device. It's very complex and has some really cool electronics and stuff in it, but it is a mechanical device that can be replaced by a mechanical device. Um, you know, uh, uh, lumbar discs and disc intervertebral discs can be replaced by synthetic things because they're just mechanical uh, objects, you know, but the things like Heart the, pa- valves. the p- pancreas is um, uh, that's that's one that's a little more complex, but e- relatively mm-hmm. easy to replace with machines. You just have to if you're just going to do it for insulin, you have um, you know a probe that um, that hears the signal of blood sugar. And then another device that injects the right amount of insulin when it receives that signal, that'll take care of that. And then you can just take pancreatic enzymes by mouth and replace the other part of what the pancreas does. Now, when you get to things like the liver and kidneys is way harder. The liver is an unbelievably complex chemical factory that takes, you know, uh, molecules and just changes them from one to the other and makes bile, and it does so many things. It's interconnected with a lot of different systems in the body. Um, the uh, kidneys are also difficult to replace. So, you know, those are the things where we've got a lot of room to uh, improve on medical science on those. Anyway, all right, very good. Very good. Yep. Today's episode is brought to you by Angie. Angie has made it easier than ever to connect with skilled professionals to get all your jobs and projects done well. Let me tell you, there's the version of it where you try to do something at home, and then there's a version of it where you have someone help you, you watch them do it the right way, and you go, thank God I didn't try to do that myself. I have fully done things around the home that I think look good, and then a bang in the night, and I wake up to a shelf collapsing, a painting falling off the wall. Like it, I've, I've seen it all go south. I own a home, and I can tell you... I know how much work it can take, whether it's everyday maintenance and repairs or making dream projects a reality. It can be hard just to know where to start. But now all you need to do is Angie that and find a skilled local pro who will deliver the quality and expertise you need. Whatever your home project, big or small, indoor or outdoor, you can Angie that and connect with skilled professionals to get the project done well. Right now, one of my wish lists is I want a bike for my condo in Milwaukee and I would love to rig it up on a pulley in the ceiling because I have one of those like lofted ceilings, but I'm so scared to try that on my own. Angie has 20 years of home experience and they've combined it with new tools to simplify the whole process. Bring them your project online or with the Angie app. Answer a few questions and Angie can handle the rest from start to finish or help you compare quotes from multiple pros and connect instantly, which means you can take care of any home project in just a few taps. Because when it comes to getting the most out of your home, you can do this when you Angie that. Download the free Angie mobile app today or visit Angie.com. That's A-N-G-I dot com. Sergeant and Mr. Smith, you're going to love this house. Bunk beds in a closet? There's no field manual for finding the right home. But when you do, USAA Homeowners Insurance can help protect it the right way. Restrictions apply. This is what you do when you've just found that statement handbag on eBay and you want to build an entire wardrobe around it. You start selling to keep buying. Yep, on eBay. Over that all-black everything phase? List it and buy all the color. Feeling more vintage than ever? It's out with the new and in with the pre-loved. Next thing you know, you've refreshed your wardrobe basically without spending a dime. Yeah, eBay. The place to buy and sell new, pre-loved, vintage, and rare fashion. With Walmart's new Fresh and Frozen subscriptions, you can save time on your weekly grocery shopping. Dad, you're supposed to be grocery shopping. And miss the chance to embarrass you in front of your friends? (laughs) I subscribe to snacks and wet napkins. You know how messy you are. Dad! Walmart. Subscribe to your weekly list. Earning your degree online doesn't mean you have to go about it alone. At Capella University, we're here to support you when you're ready. From enrollment counselors who get to know you and your goals, to academic coaches who can help you form a plan to stay on track. We care about your success and are dedicated to helping you pursue your goals. Going back to school is a big step, but having support at every step of your academic journey can make a big difference. Imagine your future differently 
at capella.edu. Hey, Dr. Steve. Hey. This is Dan. Hey, Dan. Ramp Salt. Oh, it's old Ramp Salt. Go to uh, West Virginia, or just Google West Virginia Ramp Salt. And he, do you know, guys know what ramps are? A lot of yes, people they're think delicious. they're weed. They are delicious. You can just pull them right out of the ground and eat them. Yep. And uh, he makes, he dries them and mixes them with like kosher salt or, you mm. know, uh, and sells it as ramp salt. And it's, I that think it's so good. W, Google, if you don't mind, wvrampsalt.com. I think that's the one where he is. Anyway, all right. I just had a lung screening done and it said my heart was good, my lungs were good, but I have severe. Coronary calcification. Dope. Uh oh. <laughs> and I was wondering if you could talk about that and sure. let me know that there was an alternative to having any kind of surgery. Or... Well, okay. Yeah, let's not put the cart before the horse. You're not <laughs> symptomatic, but you want to prevent heart attack and stroke. So if you if it was truly read as severe, I would see a cardiologist for this and say, hey, I had this scan. It showed severe calcification. I know that's not the scan where we're actually looking for heart stuff. So this is what they call an incidental finding. But the incidental finding is uh, something that uh, we don't want to ignore. And they will uh, do some tests on you and uh, and try to mitigate your risk. Number one, don't smoke. If you're diabetic, get your sugar under control. If you have high blood pressure, get that under control and, uh, you know, increase your exercise. But see a cardiologist and let them look at it and see if they want to do some other testing. They may throw you on a on a treadmill or they may even if they, if it looks bad enough they may want to do Heart a cardiac cat. cath yeah and just see how uh, obstructed you are because you can have calcification not be obstructed you can also not have calcification and be completely obstructed so uh, that test is not a great test for um, uh, for cardiac risk but it is a test that says hey there's a we we got a signal here maybe we need to follow up on it okay did you find the website? Was it WV Yeah, it Rapsol? looks great. The website looks fabulous. Yeah, we need to get some of that. And you know, I've never heard of it before, but it's wvrampsalt.com. Yeah, and I did um I dry brined this year for Easter. I dry brined a um uh rib roast. And uh it was uh, we used Sam the cooking guy's BFF to to <laughs> dry brine it. Little plug for him. Go to S T Sam the Cooking Guy. S T C G dot com. Oh, right? shit. I'll look it up. And uh, his uh, uh, his salt and pepper and uh, spice mix called uh, BFF and uh, best effing flavor or something like that. But it's really really good. And I dry brined it with that. Twenty four hours in the refrigerator, uncovered, and then baked uh, roasted it at. Uh, 250 until the internal temperature was 120, took it out, let it rest for an hour. The internal temperature continued to rise as it equilibrated up to about 150, 140, 150, and then threw it in the oven at 500 just to crisp up the outside. It's perfect. That's perfect rib roast. But anyway, I would like to try the ramp salt as a dry brine and see how it does. Yeah. This it, He's at um, thecookingguy.com. Thecookingguy.com. Okay. Yeah. And uh, um, I, I, I think that would make a really unique tasting roast, and we should try that. So, all right. So there you go, my friend. Uh, good luck. Yeah. Good luck with that. Hey, Doctor Steve. Hey, man. I've got another question for you. Okay. It's hard to kind of explain. Like, so white blood cells and sperm cells are kind of like autonomous, but how do they have energy to? be mobile and all that stuff. Oh, yeah. And how else, are, and are there any other structures or parts of our body that are kind of completely autonomous from us and not connected to us? Just curious. Thanks. Right. Oh, this is an interesting question. Now, uh, DNP Carissa, do you want to talk about how cells uh, have energy to do things in the body? Do I want to? Yes. No. <laughs> no. No. Cells, you know, create ATP and okay. just make energy. Okay. Wow. That's a... It was a really good description, wasn't it? <laughs> yes. Well, ATP 
is the sort of uh, powerhouse of the cell. The mitochondria help to uh, uh, also power cells, but ATP is that is sort of the gasoline of the cells. And uh, but there are other high energy compounds that are used for biological work. But sperm cells, for example are produced in the human testes, and then they are released as semi, or they're autonomous, uh, with one purpose, to fertilize an egg. And just, uh, you know, half the time they get spewed out onto a Kleenex or something, I guess, and they're like, whoa, 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 you know, what the hell? But, But the rest of the time we forget that their job is to, um, you know, invade a uterus and then look around for an egg that wants to be implanted. And, uh, you know, the odds are just unbelievable. If you have Unbelievable. It's, it's amazing anybody ever has kids. It's true. 250 million sperm uh, and one egg, and one of them's got to impregnate this egg. And then it's got to go through all these processes to to produce a human from that one fused cell. It's unbelievable. And just think, you're the sperm that won. Right. Exactly. Right. It's crazy. Yeah, it is nuts. So uh, they power Hmm. their movement through stored uh, when they're created in the body. They have uh, stored um, uh, carbohydrates that then um, are are, are converted to this ATP, which then uh, allows them to move their tails, basically. And if you want to see something amazing, just look at. Uh, sperm cell tail uh, motility, and there are these 3D recreations of what the molecules are doing in there, and it's just motors. I mean, the evolution created motors before people even thought that there was such a thing like a wheel or anything yeah, like that. It's cool. un- it's unbelievable. So uh, the bioenergetics of sperm are cells are very. Um, you know, it's very complicated, but they, you know, glucose is oxidized to this pyruvate and then you get this two ATP and you get an electron in the form of this stuff called NADH. And then you, oh, you, you, it just goes on and on and on, but just suffice it to say that there are mechanisms, chemical mechanisms that allow energy to be transferred from energy to motion through these bioenergetic uh, pathways. And the same thing with white blood cells. But we, we, talk, we think of them as being separate from us. They're not. We think of ourselves as being separate from the universe that we are born into, right? Because we, are, we think of ourselves as being autonomous sacks of meat that are separated from the ground because I can lift my feet up from the ground. But we, we are not dumped into this world. We are born into this world. We start as a one cell and beca- that and every um, atom in our body was created in the heart of a star. So we are not separate from the universe. We are born into the universe. We're born out of the universe and we're inherently part of the universe. The same way that uh, white blood cells are not separate from us. They are you know, created in our body and then released to do their thing, and they're inherently part of our body. And they, don't, they won't live any amount of time outside of the body, just like sperm cells won't either, because they just get dry and crusty and, you know, all nasty, and you got to clean them up the next morning. But anyway, so... Oh, the um, next for, for morning. For God's sake. <laughs> <laughs> what are you talking about? I don't even know. Oh, stop it. So, anyway, all right. So, yes, uh, it is fascinating, and the whole idea of uh, bioenergetics is, um, is in, in, incredibly complicated, but also just amazing that this shit was going on. You know, we talk about um, how proton pump inhibitors, right, uh, like omeprazole, a.k.a. Um, uh, Prilosec, block a, uh, a pump in the stomach that moves a proton from one side of a membrane to the other. Acid man. Protons. (laughs) That's what we called it, acid man. (laughs) Protons are 
quantum objects made up of three quarks that are bound together. They get almost all of their mass from the binding energy of those quarks uh, uh, just interacting with each other. And yet, uh, so they're a quantum object, and yet dinosaurs had proton pump proton pumps in their stomachs. Uh, and they were manipulating quantum objects before humans even were part of this world that and we only con, you know conceived of quantum objects a uh, hundred years ago. It's fucking mm. unbelievable. Yeah, it really is. Okay, but it's enough. All right. All right. I no. find it fascinating. Thank you. What else is autonomous? No. Aud- oh. Did you like that word? I am too smart. <laughs> I am too smart. I am too smart. Autonomous. Okay, what other parts of the body are autonomous? Well, he asked that. I did, I know he did, and uh, those are the two I can think of. Well, uh, um, you know, egg, you know, female eggs, uh, ova are sort of semi-autonomous. They they don't really have motile ability. The body moves those things around, so they just kind of shuffle them around with cilia. So, um, yeah, I can't what think of anything else. What about the whole else. autonomous nervous system? The autonomic Ooh. nervous mm-hmm. system, you mean? You like that? <laughs> it's, I don't know how autonomous it is, but it is autonomic in that it operates without the conscious. The hypothalamus just does it all for us. Well. And we're not mm. paying attention. Mm. Why don't you something? Anyway. Oh, no. What about the thyroid? Doesn't it just do well, whatever? Yeah, they, they, the wants. heart beats, you breathe, you yeah. blink, Sure, all of those things. Constrict, yeah, blink. you don't have to think about them. So if you think of it that way, then they're autonomous. Can you imagine if you had to think Isn't every that time what you that means? breathed? Yeah, yeah, that's what it means. That's what it means. <laughs> okay, I'm an asshole. Breath now. Oh, these two of them. Need to take a breath now. Okay. It's fine. I can't even say words, so I don't even know why I'm here. <laughs> Isn't it funny that, yeah, we can control breathing? Like I, yeah, it's so like Tacey was just demonstrating. Do it again, Tace. It's awesome. No. <laughs> I see you messing with your little keyboard yeah, there. Yeah, you were getting ready. No. I was getting ready to push a button. Uh, yes, you can control your breathing to a certain extent. You can hold your breath. You can breathe faster and hyperventilate if you want to. <clears throat> but you don't have to think about it if you don't want to. If you're doing something else, you're just breathing. But um, very few people can control their heart rate. Can you flap? Well, anyway, all right. They're all just right. looking at no, me. No, it's totally fine. Ask the question. Totally fine. Nope. What nope, were you nope, gonna nope. ask? Nope. Nothing. I'm not gonna live it down. What nope. were you gonna ask? Sorry. Right. I'm gonna walk away. I'm gonna leave. Hey, Doctor okay. Steve Jethro <laughs> from PA. Glad to hear you recovered from your COVID-19. Thank yeah, you, my that friend. Was fun. My question of the week: I was out splitting wood with the wood wedge, the big metal piece that you use to split up the larger pieces. Yeah. It popped out of the wood and went right into my shin, Ooh. right down to the bone. Ooh. Nice five stitches worth, plus a little tetanus booster shot. Oh, fun. My question is, what is the effectiveness of the booster shots? I'm yeah. 43 years old and probably haven't had a booster in 20 years. Okay. And if I didn't get the booster, am I still covered? No. Yeah. About time we talk about other vaccines aside from the. Yeah, no shit. Agreed. Thank you. SARS CoV 2. Yeah. God bless you. Yeah, you I too, buddy. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> so, yeah, I, to my knowledge, and I would love to ask a, um, an infectious disease person that studied the history of this, there hasn't been a single person who died from tetanus that got the original three shots when they were kids. I've only seen one case of tetanus in my career, and it was an elderly lady that never had a tetanus vaccine. So when you go to the pharmacy and you're getting a vaccine, they ask you, are you due a tetanus shot? Right. Who the hell remembers if they're due a tetanus shot? Well, that's why they they should be hopefully keeping records. And And they're doing better with that. They are. There are some centralized records and stuff. So you want it every 10 years. And that's the shot that when you get it, it feels like somebody gave you a a noogie in your your shoulder. I think I'm going to do Shingrix and tetanus at the same time. Just get it all over with and have a hell of a weekend. (laughs) (laughs) So one of the things when you have a wound, you want to, is it a clean minor wound? 
then ha- and has the patient had a primary tetanus diphtheria series? If the answer to both of those is yes, if the most recent dose was in the past 10 years, you don't need to get a vaccine. You don't have, need a booster. Okay. Hmm. Now, if it wasn't within the 10 years and or they're presenting there. Or if you don't there, know. Yeah, then you go ahead and give it. Now, uh, yeah, and that's right. And if it's unknown, if they completed a primary, you know, the first three shots. Yes. Now, Infectious it, disease is researching changing it to every 30 years. That's awesome. And that's probably why the, the, the same sort of uh, uh, concept that if you had she the original three. That. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, you do. Need I, a bell I mean, that. I've needed like five yeah. bells. Give thyself so. a bell. I gave you one, but I'm not giving you. No, she's had Come a couple. You've had a couple. No. Nope. Yes, you have. Nope. Two, right? No, you, that's, a, that's your third. Two to two. Oh. Oh, my God. Oh, stop. All right. Okay, no more. Can you please stop bullshitting? Okay, so. I never bullshit. Assessing the wound. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you do. <laughs> any other wound contaminated with dirt, <laughs> fecal mm. matter, oh. saliva, soil, puncture wounds, avulsions, that's where, you know, the skin is just torn away, wounds resulting from flying or crushing objects, animal bites, burns, or frostbite, then if you've had a primary tetanus diphtheria series and it was within the last five years, you don't have to do a tetanus vaccine. But if it was more than five years ago or if you don't know, you should get um, the next dose uh, right then. And then if they have never had the primary tetanus series then absolutely you have to give them not only the vaccine, but you got to give them tetanus immune globulin because mm. they are at high risk for tetanus. Like if you step on a board in a cow pasture oh. that is covered, the board is covered by a cow plop and there's a nail in it and it punctures your foot. Those are the kind of wounds that you've got to worry about when it comes to tetanus. Got it. All right. Excellent. Estimated half-life is 27 years. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, so every 10 years seems overkill. Yeah, 95% of the population is estimated to remain protected against tetanus and diphtheria for greater than 30 years without requiring further booster. Well, there you go. We're going to hearken to thine inner voice and oh, give thyself you get the a real bell. bell. No task shalt be denied if thy will like be research. strong and oh, true. Like, for when I just have to look at everything up. Carries with <laughs> the sound of courage. All right, and well, we like did clonic like. ozone last time. I do. Let's do this one. Be mindful nope. of its power. Yeah, I was just listening to your uh, bulbs rinsing and not forcing it in there too hard. Uh, is it possible to really hurt your eardrum by forcing it too much? Because years ago, I used to work at a shipyard up in northern Wisconsin here, and uh, I had some beer wax in my ears, and they took a, uh, a blaster, and they call, it, they call it get the dynamite out, and they blasted that water in there so hard. I mean, ever since then, my ears have been ringing like crazy. Oh, shoot. And that was in uh, the late 70s. Yes. Could that be why my ears are ringing? Yes. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, if it's temporarily related and they blasted it in there with the dynamite, then yes, that, that's probably what caused it. And what you may have is actually uh, you could have had a rupture in your eardrum. So have, let somebody look at it. They might still be able to fix it unless it's just completely ruined. Know. Yeah. Or they may have torn one of the small muscles um, away from, um, I'm sorry, the small um, bones in the in the middle ear uh, away from its attachment. Or more likely what they did was they, uh, it was such a high decibel sound to the inner ear that actually damaged the, the um, receptor in the inner ear. And uh, that's a problem. That's harder to fix. With our current technology, it may be impossible to fix. But seeing an ear, nose, and throat doc, telling them what happened, and they'll do some audiology testing. They may be able to fine-tune a hearing aid uh, that would have a parametric equalizer in there to take out that, that one note that maybe you're hearing. If it's just a single note, um, uh, you know, it's a high-pitched ring, they can... <clears throat> put a notch filter in there, all kinds of things that they can do. That's they're re- cool. They're really good at this stuff now. So, But see an ear, nose, and throat that has an audiologist in their office and see if they can't uh, work something out. Did you have something for no. that? Okay. All right. All right. Uh, we did that. Oh, here's giant media erection. What's that about? Oh. 
Uh, I was just out dropping my kids off, getting gas, listening to the podcast. Oh, no, we have played this before. This is a guy, he, he was listening to the podcast in his car, and just as he stepped out to get gas, and his kid's in the car, by the way, and they're in their little car seat. Oh. And just as he's getting out, he hears me saying, giant meat erection for some <laughs> nice, reason or another. Steve, nice. Yeah, I'm sorry about that. And I just did hmm. it again. All right. Uh, Those are always nice. Here's a tone. It says toenails for Dr. Steve. Why is it that Uh-oh. when you get old? Okay, we did that one already. already Let's see. Okay. Um, okay, here we go. Hey, Dr. Steve, this is John from Washington, D.C. Hey, How are you? Hey, good, man. I guess this is where I'm supposed to say, I'm going to just pretend we're having a conversation and say good, thank you. <laughs> um, I had a question, a couple questions, actually, about weed. Okay. Uh, I just turned 40 and trying to give my liver a break and also slim down a little bit. So I have kind of cut out alcohol altogether. Didn't have a problem with it per se, but, you know, would have at least one drink every night. Okay. And I still want my treat at the end of the day. Mm. And I just don't like being alone with my own thoughts. So I recently, at 40, decided to start getting more and more into marijuana. Okay. And a couple of questions for you about that. First of all, um, I'm scared of edibles and their unpredictability, so I've been vaping for the most part. Okay. I assume there's no free lunch when it comes to any sort of. Did we substances. do this? Because so, I remember. Well, I might be giving my liver a break. I don't think so. Um, is there a real risk associated with frequent vaping? We've talked about vaping before, but not. We've this also m- talked about free lunches before. Oh, okay. With uh, with weed or anything like that, and also. Well, the thing I want to talk about is uh, there was a longitudinal study that um, looked at non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And uh, there were some previous studies that suggested that cannabis use is associated with lower risk of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. So this is people who have fat infiltration of the liver, probably caused by glucose intolerance or a high carbohydrate intake or other, it could be genetic things. Um, and um, they, they have liver disease, but it's not caused by alcohol. And uh, so there were some studies in the past that showed that people who used cannabis had less non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And so they were wondering if there was a relationship between the two. So uh, they did a um, meta-analysis on a very large data set uh, looking at lifetime use of cannabis and, um, and then looking at non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And they did this thing called a sensitivity analysis. And there was really, in that case, no statistically significant effect between either lifetime cannabis use uh, and, and the risk or, or cannabis dependence and the risk for non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. So it didn't hurt or help okay. in that particular study. Hmm. So um, uh, there's no causal effect or protection against the development of it. So that if you heard that about those previous observational studies, which are bad data for the most part, then uh, that you really probably can't use. I'm going to smoke pot to protect my liver. But if you're smoking pot instead of drinking, it, pot doesn't seem to affect the liver in an adverse way, whereas alcohol and Tylenol and other drugs do. So uh, there may be something there. Okay. So, but, uh, you know, talk to your health care provider. You know, it's, if your state, if it's legal and you're using it responsibly, then, you know, we go, go have fun. I think pot should be legal. I really do. I've always said that. I do, too. It's, uh, putting it, making it a black market item really causes more problems than it uh, solves. And Agreed. legalizing it creates fewer problems than you would think. So, anyway. All right. Well, thanks, everybody. Thank you. Uh, that was a chaotic but f- a fun show. Well, thanks, Tacey. that's not here to th- anchor us. Oh, so it was, okay. Come okay, well, source. I'll tell you what. Let's get out of here. And uh, thank you all. Um, we will not be doing uh, drinking shows anytime. Yes, we will. Twat Next walk-ups. Saturday, we'll see you. Um, yes, and we will all be sober at um, and Mike Judge. He will. Okay. <laughs>
Thanks always go to my partner, Tacey, and my other partner, Carissa. Uh, thanks to everyone who's made this show happen over the years. Uh, listen to our SiriusXM show on the Faction Talk channel, SiriusXM channel 103, Saturdays at 7 p.m. Eastern, Sunday at 6 p.m. Eastern, on demand, and other times at Jim McClure's pleasure. Many thanks to our listeners whose voicemail and topic ideas make this job very easy. Go to our website at drsteve.com for schedules, podcasts, and other crap. Until next time, check your stupid nuts for lumps, quit smoking, get off your asses, and get some exercise. We'll see you in one week for the next edition of Weird Medicine. Thanks, everyone. Goodbye, everyone. Goodbye.